Did you see the topic today? It's called fire destruction and judgment. And uh, you know, Josiah came in, he's like, hey, I can tell we're getting near to the end because when you start talking about like the destruction and the fire, it, yeah, we're, we're totally gonna go there today. And this is one of those messages, you know, I was telling the team before we met and even a couple days ago, you know, for me, uh, sometimes the end times is really messy. Sometimes, in fact, we're going to get into that where Peter even describes Paul's writings as it's confusing and it's hard to understand. But there's something about today's message. I, I'm almost having a hard time because I actually think it's too clean. And I, I was telling the guys, I'm like, there's got to be some messiness here. So we'll find it. We'll unpack it. And it'll probably, hopefully, yeah, you'll see some of that. But I really, I really believe that in today's message, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty, pretty literal. Kevin, what you say we've taken for the most part, most of this has been pretty literal. But what the word says is what it says. If you guys would, would you open up your word, go to Revelation 20. Now, as we're doing this, you, you know that our goal is, is that everybody sees the big picture. So we're going to always do this. I'm going to do it a little bit differently. You know, we know that you're going to have a seven year tribulation. Okay, we're, we've covered that. I mean, Kevin, multiple times, I would say. <laughs> You're going to have the Antichrist, okay? The Antichrist is going to come in, and he's going to actually be in the temple. So we know that there has to be a temple in the middle of all of this. And then the last three and a half years of this tribulation is it's called the Great Tribulation. Now, in the process, at the end of the tribulation, okay, we believe there's going to be what's called, and we've been talking about this, what's called the wrath of God. Right before the wrath, we believe that what we've communicated is, is that, Kevin, we're going to see what's called the rapture. But right before the rapture, Kevin, what happens to the dead people that believe in Jesus? The dead go first. Yep, they, that, yeah. That's right. So you would actually have the resurrection and the rapture that takes place before the wrath of God. Now, Kevin, we started to get into the wrath of God. What are some, on the seventh seal, right? It then initiates what? Seven trumpets. So you have seven trumpets. And then what we talked about last week, and again, can we prove it 100%? We can't. But I think it's fair to say that the trumpets and what, Kevin? The trumpets and the bulls. And those are a picture of the wrath of God. Now, in the tribulation, Kevin, we would, all, we would call that Satan's wrath. But after the tribulation, after you have these seven years, it's going to come the wrath of God. Now, in the wrath of God, we have 144,000 people. Who are they, Kevin? They are Jewish evangelists, virgins, that are sealed to go through God's wrath. So in the midst of wrath, they're talking about Jesus. Why do we say that? Because it's the same reason that God gave in the last three and a half years he gave them two witnesses. What were they doing? They were communicating hope as well. Judgment, I want to make sure everybody understands, judgment is coming, and at the same time, so is hope. So in the middle of chaos, the last three and a half years, you've got messengers that are delivering the gospel. In the last uh, wrath of God period, in this period, of God, we don't know how long the wrath of God is, by the way, but we do know that there's 144,000 evangelists that are sealed, nothing can touch them, and they're delivering the good news. I think this is important to understand. This is your backdrop for us to come into today's message. Because at some point, what's going to happen, and I want to say this, by the way, when the resurrection and the rapture is taking place as the wrath of God is unfolding, you know what you have here? It's pretty, pretty special. You have, Kevin, what we would call the wedding feast, right? <laughs> the believers are hanging out that are getting ready for what we would call the thousand years. And this thousand years is the, is the I want to say the banquet, but it's also the, the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Boots. So while this hell is breaking out on earth, and it's nothing compared, compared to what we're going to see, is the believers that know Jesus, they're out of the picture. Kevin, we also have what's called the Bema Seat. Do you remember what the Bema Seat is? Uh, it's rewards for believers. That's right. So the believers get to live out their rewards in the thousand years. Where is Armageddon in all of this? In kind of that under the red. 
It, it's, <laughs> all right, so really right, right here, Armageddon is after what? After the Great Tribulation, before the thousand year reign. Yeah. So really Armageddon, you guys, is Revelation 19. Kevin, Revelation 19 is where Jesus is coming on his horse, right? You remember this? And he's coming in Megiddo. Remember all of these nations that are coming from Megiddo and they come down to what city, Kevin? The major city. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And you have an ultimate battle. This is what we would call the first major battle. Now, some also reference this in Ezekiel 38 39. Kevin, it's also known as Gog and Magog. Magog. Now, hang in here with me. So, the battle of Armageddon is when Christ returns. Everybody with me on that? It's when he returns. This is the massive bloodbath that we're talking about. But we're going to get to today. What we're going to talk about, and this is the part that bothers me, is that we're talking about the end times, fire, destruction, and judgment. There's another major battle that nobody really talks about. All we talk about is Armageddon and Armageddon and Armageddon. But Armageddon is not what brings the destruction of the earth. There's another battle that will launch into the destruction of the earth. So when we talk about that one today, it's not this one. Christ comes back. Okay, here it is. Christ comes back. He implements th this big battle. And then Kevin, he hangs out for how long? A thousand years. So Christ now is living here on, on earth. So Christ is ruling, right? He rules and reigns. Okay, so we have resurrected bodies during the thousand years, correct? Does that make sense? So those that were raptured, those that were dead, that came back to life, we're hanging out with him. But there are non-believers in this thousand years that have mortal bodies. Isn't that weird? So you have resurrected bodies, right? And then you have mortal bodies. And you have sinners. This is your backdrop for today. I think, Kevin, we've covered it. Now, this is the part that gets you excited. I know this is the part that gets you excited. Where is Satan in all of this in the thousand year period, Kevin? He is in the abyss. He is in the abyss. So everybody, if you would, would you go to Revelation 20, okay? Revelation 20, uh, let's look in verse two. Revelation 20, verse two, it says, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years. So in this thousand years, Satan is down here. He is in the abyss. Satan has no access to those in the millennium. But Kevin, what else though is the problem in the millennium? And sin nature is still there because it's still, still from Adam. That's right. So it says in Revelation 20 verse 3, he threw him into the abyss, closed it, put a seal on it, so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. I have to ask, do you think, Kevin, Satan knew that he was going to be released? Well, I do, because he's fighting it. He's fighting up until this point. He's fighting Christ. It says in Revelation 20, verse 4, Then I saw thrones and people seated on those that were given authority to judge. I also saw the people who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not accepted the mark on the foreheads or their hands. They came to life and they reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. So again, not to belabor on this because we've already talked about this in previous teachings, we do know that you have resurrected saints that are ruling and reigning with Christ. This is exactly what it's talking about. And they reign with him for a thousand years. While they're reigning with him for a thousand years, Satan is in the abyss waiting for his time to come up. In Revelation 20, verse 5, it says, The rest of the dead did not come to life <laughs> until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. You're kind of scratching your head. You're kind of like, hey, what does this look like? Well, we do know, you guys, that before the last, well, before the last judgment, all of the dead will be resurrected. Those that don't believe in Christ, even those that are non-believers, they will be resurrected. And they're going to meet their maker, their creator, in what's called the great white throne judgment. The rest of the dead, it says in verse 5, didn't come until the thousand years were completed. Uh, and then it says, this is the first resurrection. Now in verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. That's because that's us. We get experience in hope. 
The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of the Messiah, and they'll reign with him for a thousand years. Now, in verse 7, this is ultimately where we want to turn the corner today. When the thousand years are completed, Satan, right here, okay, who's been hanging out in the abyss, it says he will be released from his prison. So now all of a sudden, you have Satan, he's been released. And Kevin, how long is he released for? Do you remember what the scripture says? It just says a short time. Yep. We don't know what that means. His whole goal is to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth. So Kevin, this makes pretty good sense. His whole point is to bring about deception. The deception to all of the nations. Deception to all of the nations. I mean, think about this. Satan's whole role, you guys, is that what? He's the accuser. Like, he's the adversary. He, he is constantly coming against us. And he's saying false things, so he's going to do it one more time. So at one point, this is the craziest thing. Who's been ruling and reigning for a thousand years? Christ. You would think that if Christ is ruling and reigning on earth with his saints, this wouldn't be an option. But even as Christ is there with the sin nature, Satan is allowed to come in and deceive mankind for one more fight. For one more battle. And it says he gathers the nations, deceives the nations of at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Okay, this is where it gets really kind of swirly. So like at first, I'd love to tell you it's clean. You know, Gog is a representation of, of an antichrist spirit. Okay, it's an, a representation of like a ruler, a person. And Magog represents the land. Okay, so here you have, now think about this. Gog and Magog, it was a common term. Okay, according to Nelson's commentary, as a common rabbinical, rabbinical title for nations that were always in rebellion against the Lord. When you hear Gog and Magog, it's nations versus Jesus. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Tom Constable used to be a professor of mine. Uh, he has to ask the question, why, why, would, this, why would this take place? Like, this doesn't make sense. At the end of thousand years, I think everybody would like to ask the question, why? Why? This is the why. To demonstrate, now this is a hard word for me to say, so forgive me, the incorrigibility of Satan. Incorrigibility, I-N-C-O-R-R-I-G-I-B-I-L-I-T-Y. What does incorrigibility mean? It means this, when a child habitually disobeys the direction of the parents. So what is, what is this, what do we want to show? Even though Christ is ruling and reigning, the children are still not listening. Why? Because number two, he's going to show the depravity of mankind still. And so in this, he's showing and revealing it's still not done yet. So when you look at this text, and it begins to unfold, and, and by the way, in, in Revelation 20 verse 8, it says that the, the, those that were deceived, they came from the four corners of the earth, right? And their number was like the sand of the sea. So we're not talking about 10 or 15 people against Jesus. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people, maybe even millions. We don't really know, Kevin, at this point, how many people are here on earth, but it's beyond what we can actually count. That to me is ridiculous. And when you go to... Uh, Verse 9, Revelation 20, verse 9, it says, They came up over the surface of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. So where are they coming to, Kevin? More likely, Jerusalem. They surrounded the encampment of the saints, right? The beloved city. This is the reference of the heavenly city. This is in reference to like God's dwelling place. And then look what happens. Then fire came down from heaven and consume them. God ultimately comes down and destroys who? Kevin? Looks like all these people that have come against him. Can you go to Genesis 19 verse 24? This, this sounds, Genesis 19 24, this sounds very Old Testament, doesn't it? Fire just fell and boom, 
destroys them. We don't like hearing that in the New Testament because that's not really ultimately what it does. But in Genesis 19, 24, it says, Then out of the sky the Lord rained, burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord. In Genesis 19, 25, it's pretty clear. He, did, he demolished these cities, the entire plain, and all of the inhabitants of the cities, and whatever grew on the ground. Like, if God did it then, guess what? He can definitely do it again. It says in verse 10 of Revelation 20, the devil who deceived them, look what finally is done. The devil, which finally, finally, and I'll just say this, fire fell, right? So you have fire that falls <laughs> on all the inhabitants, on all the inhabitants. By the way, this fire fell from heaven. Who's ultimately in charge of that fire? When you think of end times, I want you to understand who's ultimately always in charge of the fire. He is. So when you think of fire and destruction and judgment, it's always God still in charge. Because then it says in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, what you have here is, I mean, it's pretty clear. Ultimately, you have, and the scripture describes it as uh, the devil, and he is thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. Kevin, where is that? I believe that is hell. Guess who else is hanging out down here? The beast and the false prophet. All that's been ruling and reigning over this period of time, they're all now here is what Kevin said is hell. Hell is also known as, in the Old Testament, as Sheol. So here you have now, they're thrown ultimately into this. This is at the end of the thousand years. The millennium is done. And at the end, now all of a sudden, all of these guys, they're hanging out down here. And by the way, when it says they're tormented day and night forever and ever, it means that. It's considered this lake of fire. It's called in scriptures, an outer darkness. We've heard of this. It's in reference to the wailing and gnashing of teeth in the New Testament. It's in reference to this unquenchable. Can you go to Mark 9, verse 48, Kevin? Mark 9, verse 48, it's in reference to this imagery that's not just imagery, it's reality. Mark 9, 48 says, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Finally, Satan and all of his little cronies and all the little demonic minions, they're hanging out now in hell and there's no more. They're done. So at the end of the thousand years, finally, He's thrown into the pit of hell. But just when you think <laughs> it's bad, it gets worse. And so what I want to do is, is I, want to, I want to hit a pause button on Revelation 20. And so now when you get into this picture of, okay, now these guys are down here in hell. Now what do you do? Now what happens? Kevin, we still have what I would consider a messed up earth. Correct. And so I want you to go to 2 Peter. We're going to hit a pause button on Revelation 20. We're going to come back to Revelation 20. Okay? In 2 Peter 3. Now, here's what happens. When you start in, and really you kind of have to back up just a little bit. And it says in verse 6, okay? In verse 6, it says, Though through these waters, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. So what are we referencing here? Well, We can say that already you have a reference to how, how did God destroy everything prior to the fire, Kevin? Flood. With flood. But he said he wouldn't do that ever again. But he said he wouldn't ever do that again. So I'm not going to wipe out the earth now with water, but I'm going to wipe it out with fire. It's a crazy mindset. Though these waters, through these waters, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. But now in 2 Peter 3, verse 7, by the present heavens and earth, They're held in store for fire by the same word. The same word is what? I'm going to wipe everything out, but this time I've got fire stored up for the heavens and the earth. This heavens and the earth, that language is strange, Kevin. Why does he say heavens? Because that's where it's going to come from. It, that's where it's going to come from, but he's got to destroy ultimately, not just, remember how many languages of heaven do we talk about? 
Multiple levels of heaven. I know that sounds weird, but remember you got first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. By the present heavens and earth are held in store for fire by the same word, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So now that this is taking place, he's now going to bring what we would call the fire. And this time this fire is coming, is being kept until the day of judgment. Now, Kevin, this day of judgment is for who? This is unbelievers. This is for unbelievers. Why? Because believers have already met their judgment. The Bema seat of Christ judges based on our rewards because of our, our salvation through Christ on the cross. We have already been judged. But now there's a day of judgment that's ultimately coming for unbelievers, for the lost. And how is he going to bring that judgment? Through fire. Through fire. 2 Peter 3, verse 7. And then it continues on in, the verse, uh, in verse 8. It says, Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Here's what's interesting. Okay, up until verse, uh, 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 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7, there's these scoffers saying, Yeah, right, this isn't going to happen. I don't believe that God is sovereign. I don't believe that God's going to do this. Why? Because it looks like God's really patient and he's not doing anything. And that's why he says, man, don't let this escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Well, Peter's really referencing Psalm 30, Psalm 90, verse 4. If you'll go there, Kevin. Psalm 90, verse 4. One day, I think this is important. Nelson's commentary says, believers will be vindicated by God and he will bring judgment upon the lost. Psalm 90 verse 4 says, For in your sight a thousand years are like yesterday that passes by like a few hours of the night. Interesting enough, Kevin. Can you go to verse 12? Psalm 90 verse 12. Our whole theme verse of this whole series is teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. When we number our days, we have an understanding that God's timing is not ours. And you go back to verse 4. When you number our days, you're saying, God, I don't know when your timing is, but I know your timing is bigger than ours, and I'm going to walk this out every single day because your thousand years could look like one day for us. That's having an eternal perspective in the end times. The end times means I'm going to embrace whatever he's given me now. Because I really believe, in, and it says in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord doesn't delay his promise. In other words, he still is going to what? Work his promise, work his purposes. He's still going to unfold his timing. He doesn't delay his promise. It says, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Why is he holding out as long as he can? Because he knows that fire's coming and anybody that doesn't believe in him is going straight to hell. There's no other option. And he does not want that for anybody. Kevin. He's even binding up Satan to put some restrictions on it. Man, he, Kevin, that's an awesome picture. He does everything he can to give them another chance. The two witnesses, hope. 144,000, hope. Hey, by one more time, I'm just going to delay as long as I can. Please, you lost people, look to me. 1 Timothy, if you'll go there, Kevin. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. What's his end goal? He wants to see people repent. Who wants everyone to be saved, it says. 1 Timothy, go, go to verse 3, will you please, if you don't mind. You just to get a little bit more context. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everybody to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God doesn't want to bring fire and destruction, but he's given them so many chances, so many opportunities, and he's ready. He's ready for anybody to turn to him. <laughs> Why? Because at some point in verse 10, it's pretty clear. At some point, the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved. And the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. 
you realize what this means. It means that heavens and earth will be physically destroyed. The place that you and I are standing, the way that where that we're here in the United States or in Israel or in Russia or in China, guess what? All of that is gone. Yeah, that's not really a great message, but I'm telling you, the day of judgment is coming. And yes, all heaven and earth, the heavens and earth, they're destroyed. The fire is coming. And it says it, it's pretty clear the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. So when you actually hear this phrase, do you think this place will ever be destroyed? Yes. Whew. Uh, Kevin, in all my years in seminary, in seminary, in undergrad, in church, I've never had one message ever that says that the heavens and the earth will be destroyed. And what bothers me is, this is so clear. Like, I feel like this should be messy. I feel like I should have another angle to this and say, no, 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 maybe it's not that. I don't know how else to get around this. It says, yes. Kevin. We talk about fire, hell, and brimstone being preached, but this is, this is the max here. <laughs> and here's what's crazy. Jesus talks about this. And I'm like, where was I in studying this? Matthew 24, verse 35. Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus is talking about the same language. In Matthew 24, verse 35, this is what the scripture says. Heaven, this is Jesus talking, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Did that ever bother anybody else before that time? Well, when you have an understanding of 2 Peter 3, now this makes sense. Oh, he's talking about blowing everything up. <laughs> he's talking about fire coming. And destroying it all because Satan is now in hell. Why? Why? Why does he want to blow everything up? I, I mean, I, I know that sounds so drastic, but why? What's the context in, in wanting to do this? And what's the understanding in wanting to do this? And the only way I can tell you is I'm going to define what Warren Wearsby says. When Warren Wearsby described this to me, it, it began to make sense. So please know that none of this is, is from me. And I just think this is a really good description of why. God's original creation was good. And man's sin turned good creation into this groaning creation. Does that make sense? So the land still is dealing with what? Sin. So there's this groaning creation in Romans 8, 18 through 22. Romans 8, 18 through 22. I think this is really important for us to understand. Why? Why would you do this? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits for anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be, what? Set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole earth has been, what? Groaning together with labor pains until now. The land still has to be set free. His creation still has to be set free. And when we think of like new heavens and new earth, we just think, well, but think about it. Everything that's been, I don't know how to describe this, wasted and abused and used on the earth, that's got to get fixed. And so what Wearsby says, and I think this is a really, God could not perfect, uh, permit sinful man to live in a perfect environment. So he had to curse the ground because of man in Genesis 3. Do you remember this? So then since then, Man, according to Wearsby, and I agree, man has been polluting and destroying God's creation. Resources have been wasted. Energy's been running down. Uh, the civilization has been facing a crisis. And what Wearsby says in this regards, I think it's so, so real. When we're talking about the end of the world, it's no longer just about the prophets of doom. We can talk now about sociologists, ecologists, and even atomic scientists. These guys are all saying something's coming. Something's got to be restored. So think about it from that perspective. Why does he bring fire down? Because he's got to get a fresh start. It makes total sense to me, but for some reason, it just wasn't clicking. And so now all of a sudden, when I see this, he's coming, what? To reestablish the land and the creation. Otherwise, it's still corrupt. I don't know, Kevin, is that 
clear? Does that make sense? Yeah, if you're going to have a place that God is going to ultimately dwell, it has to be it has to be holy. It has to be perfect. Yeah. Now, the one area of confusion, I have no problem telling you this, okay? In these thousand years, right? Okay, these evangelists, they're sharing the gospel. What happens to these believers now in the thousand years? We know what happens to the unbelievers. They're going to get judged. But we've already seen the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the believers. I don't know what happens to the believers that are in the millennium. I, I, it's not clear, but I want to at least address that and say, I don't know, I have an answer for that. You know, some people would say, well, they're, they're killed off in the millennium by that fight. I don't know, I don't really know. I don't have a good answer. Kevin, you got any other thoughts to that? Well, it just talks about the first resurrection. So maybe there's a second resurrection. Well, the second resurrection is just about the dead. Mm, that's true. But it could be an involvement. I don't know. I just, I want to throw that out there. Feel free to dig in and dig deep because I so far haven't found anybody. And from what I understand, I haven't seen anybody else have any good answers. But I want to put that out there to make it swirly for you. <laughs> just, you need a couple swirly things, right? Okay, now watch this. In verse 11, okay, verse 11, 2 Peter 3, 11, Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it's clear. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Duh. It's clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for and earnestly desire the coming of the day of God. The heavens will be on fire and be dissolved because of it, and the elements will melt with heat. You guys, I don't know how you can get around this. He's bringing the destruction. And because of it, I need us to get our act together and walk in godliness and holiness. That's what Peter says. In fact, he says, don't wait. Do not wait to repent and get your life together. He says, turn to me now. I, you know, I, I, cannot, I cannot go throughout this day without telling this ridiculous story yesterday. I'm sitting in the office here, and some random guy walks in the back. This is yesterday. He walks in the back. I don't know. He passed Sean, the security man, passed Kevin, the security man. No Lala, no Kathy, no Kelly. He just walks in and he goes, hey, man. I go, hey. thought maybe Amazon delivery guy, UPS, FedEx, none of the above. He goes, hey, man, I, I work just next door. Okay. Are you guys at church? Oh, well, if Rich was here, he'd say yes. Uh, you know, I said, well, we love the Lord and we're the body of Christ. And kind of starts talking, pouring out of his heart. And at that moment, I just said, man, we, we got to go pray. So we go into one of these rooms and we start praying. And this guy, he's from Africa, and he just begins to pour out his heart. And he brought his backpack. And the next thing you know, guys, I, I didn't do anything. I prayed over him. I shared the gospel. And he just started weeping. He started emptying out his backpack. He pulled out meth. He pulled out crack pipes. He pulled out everything of drug paraphernalia you can think of. Any sexual addictions, he pulled that out. I'm telling you, he pulled it all out and he just put it all on the table. Like, to me, that's this picture. If Christ is coming back today, I don't want any of this baggage in my life. I'm going to unload everything. I'm going to pull out areas that you don't even, shouldn't even know about. Because if this is a real message, this should drive us to tell anybody and everybody about Jesus Christ. And on top of that, he's going to draw people unto him. And we've done nothing about that. And I think what's so crazy is, is that we're okay staying quiet about this. And he says in verse 13 in 2 Peter, Verse 13, but based on his promise, we wait for the new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found at peace with him without spot or blemish. Also regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all of his letters in which there are some matters that are a little hard to understand. <laughs> Peter calls out Paul. He's like, hey, dude, you should make it clear. The untaught and the unstable, they twist them to their own destruction. And they also do that with the rest of the scriptures. And what is he saying? I need you to make the most of the salvation today. Because this is real. This is as real as it gets. Do not waste time anymore. 
I want you to go to Revelation 20. I want you to go back to Revelation 20. So now what we've done is that we've established, okay? Satan has been released. Fire falls and onto the, all those, that, that, the thousands of, beyond the sand of the sea, right? All of this language, right? Uh, the inhabitants, they're consumed and they're killed in this second battle called Gog and Magog. It's not Armageddon, it's the second battle. The devil is thrown into the lake of fire. As this lake of fire, uh, as the devil, the Antichrist, the demonic spirit, is they're all now in hell and Sheol, and they cannot get out. They're being tormented day and night. But we still have these group of believers. Uh, sorry, we have these group of unbelievers that we have to deal with. In Revelation 20, verse 11, this is where it begins. So now that you have this is in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, you have what's called the great white throne of judgment. And this is for what we would call the lost. I saw a great white throne and the one seated. Now, when it says the one seated, the big question is, is who's the one? Is it the father? Yes. <laughs> is it the son? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality because, uh, hang on here, let me get to my text here. Yeah, when you get into this text, you have the great white throne and you have the one seated. I, I believe it's a fair statement to say that it's going to be the father and the son because the son, right, was given authority to sit right next to the father. So here you have both of them. They are here and heaven and earth fled from his presence. So Kevin, at this point, once a great white throne of judgment has taken place, earth and heaven has what? They're burned up. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. Earth and heaven has fled, and there's no place found for them. You know what that means? They're nowhere. <laughs> they're burned up. They're melted. They're dissolved. They're disintegrated. All of the above. And now it's time to address the lost. In verse 12, it says, I also saw, remember, John is seeing these things. I also saw the dead, the great and the small. I always wondered what that means. You got any thoughts, Kevin? Well, it talks about giants in the Old Testament, so maybe it's... So you're thinking about size-wise. It could be size-wise. It could be people. Like, it could be, like, the famous dead people that don't know Jesus, right? I mean, it could be, like, the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, these kind of people that have all this destruction. But the reality is, when it comes to the dead, they're all equal. <laughs> dead is dead. Now, that's I could get into that a little bit here, but... I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. That's a great white throne of judgment. And why white? It's purity. Purity, absolutely. Why white? Because this white reflects this purity, this holiness, these aspects that I believe represent the Lord. I know I have this here. Hang on. I wanted to go there, but we'll keep going. And so here you have, it says this in verse 12, another book. Okay, standing before, so they're standing before the throne. And the books were opened. <laughs> these books, what are these books? Hang on here. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. So you have books that have kept uh, records of all of their deeds. And then you have the book of life. Kevin, who's that for? That was for the believers. That's for the believers. So the book of life, you're good. You're not being judged. But these books that are being opened, they're now evaluating all the lost people and all of the darkness and the evilness that they've done. They are truly being judged, yes, based on what they did here on earth. Man, it is absolutely ridiculous. I'll give you a, just a couple examples, but... Um, this book of life, I just want to just emphasize, this is, uh, if you know the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, if you believe that he died for your sins, you are not a part of this picture. If you're listening to this message and you're concerned, I don't know if this is me or somebody else, I just have to tell you, you always have a chance right now to be part of that book of life. You can surrender right now, repent of your sins and say, Jesus, forgive me of what I've done. And in, in that moment, when you make him Lord of your life, you now are a part of God's kingdom. 
I mean, Kevin put up here, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Scripture says, you will be saved. Saved from what? The great white throne of judgment. You'll be saved from hell. You'll be saved from eternal damnation. You'll be saved from tormenting fire night and day. When you think of an end times message about fire and brimstone, this is it. If you don't know Jesus, it's not a, it's not a, oh, it's a, oh, it's okay. No, you're going to hell. And it's truth. And the scripture is pretty clear. He says in Revelation 20, verse 13, then the sea, so here you have it. Here's that second re resurrection. Do you remember this? We talked about this. Then the, then the sea gave up its dead and the death in Hades gave up their dead. In other words, all that those that did not know Christ, every person that's dead is now going to meet their spirit and that dead body and that spirit is going to be before the great white throne of judgment. And they're going to be judged, not based on salvation, but based on their works. And we all know that nobody can equal and have enough good to get to God. They're going to be judged according to their works. And then at that point, it says death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So at that point, you guys, you understand death is no more. At that point, death is no more. It says death and Hades are thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anybody not found in the written book of the life, and anybody not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the verse that talks about you will go straight to hell if you do not know Jesus Christ. So when we talk about fire and destruction, we're talking about heavens and earth being destroyed. Yes, Satan is now thrown into hell. But now he says, yeah, but if you don't want to place your trust in me, you will not be with me forever. Can I make this really clear? If you decide that Jesus is not your Lord and you follow any other false Messiah or any other religion and you don't put your trust in Jesus Christ, Revelation 20, verse 15, is your home. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that for a lost person. That's why Jesus is so slow. That's why God is slow, slow. He's so patient. He doesn't want anybody. He wants anybody to receive his salvation. Revelation 20, verse 15, is one of the worst verses in all of Scripture. It's called eternal punishment. There's a text. I don't know where it is. It's in John. I have it here. John Kevin, verse 5, verse 24. John 5, verse 24. This is, this is where you can have your hope. In John 5, 24, Scripture just says this. This is Jesus' words. I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me, who believes that God the Father sent Jesus Christ, you have eternal life and you will not come under judgment. But you've passed from death to life. In other words, the scripture is so clear. If you turn to Christ, you have life. You have nothing to worry about here. Nothing. But if you choose to reject the message of the salvation of Jesus Christ, not only do you face the great white throne of judgment, you are thrown into the pit of hell. I think for me, when you know that your neighbor that is next to you doesn't know Jesus, pray for their salvation. When you know there's kids in your school and they don't know Jesus, instead of getting mad at them saying, oh, they act like lost people, pray for them and talk to them about the Lord. Because if they do not trust Christ, they are going straight to hell. That's Hindus, that's Muslims, that's Buddhists, that's atheists, that's agnostics. It's anybody that says, I don't believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord. Please pray for their salvation, that they can experience hope and life and not damnation and fire. Yeah, this is a hard message. This is one that should mess you up. And it does me. That's why to number our days is important. We gotta make the most of what we've been given so people can see Christ in their life.